because you're going to have to pay a price either way. If you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, there's a price to be paid. It may even mean death. It may mean that your family turns against you. It may mean that you lose some friends. It may mean that you'll have to even give up some of the things that you're doing because you know they're ethically and morally wrong. The whole pattern of your life has to change because that's what repentance means. It means change and you have to repent or you're going to perish, said Jesus. So if you follow Christ, it's going to cost you something. But if you don't follow Christ and don't receive Christ, it's going to cost you something too and going to cost you far more. What's it going to cost not to follow Christ? How many of us really sit down and count the cost even when we go to get married? That's one of the reasons that one out of every two marriages in America is breaking up. We don't sit down and count the cost. A young woman I read about the other day married a boy because of his handsome face and his athletic figure. She didn't sit down and think about his mental and his spiritual and his moral qualifications. She just married him. Six months later, they win the divorce court. The same is true in education. We don't think it through many times, or business, or athletics. And you know, in the, in the Olympics, I was interested in how much time those fellows have to spend in training. I heard some of them say that they would spend eight and 10 hours a day in training for their special event. No wonder they were so good and thrilled audiences all over the world. Now, if you don't follow Christ and you don't pay the price of serving him, it'll cost you, first of all, the sacrifice of peace, of conscience, and heart. You will not have peace with God. You will not be reconciled to God. You will be considered an enemy of God. You don't consider yourself an enemy of God, but he considers you an enemy. Because you have rejected his love. You've rejected his offer of reconciliation. You've rejected his offer of peace. And so you sacrifice that. There, being therefore justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But the scripture says, there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Now that word wicked is used there in Isaiah 57. It doesn't mean that you're a criminal. It doesn't mean that you're vicious. But anyone who is not conforming to the will of God and conforming to the image of Christ is considered in the sight of God wicked. That's what that word wicked is translated from the Hebrew there, means. Now you may have pleasure and fun and merriment and gaiety and good times and delightful times. You may succeed in drowning the voice of your conscience in excitement, pleasure, money getting and something else. But way down in the bottom of your heart, you don't have peace with God. You give that up. I was interested in reading just a short time ago one of the great intellectuals of Canada. He's a professor at one of Canada's great universities. I'm not going to call his name. I wouldn't want to embarrass him, even though it was in the newspaper. But here's what he said. Listen to what he said in the, in the press. Quote, there are so many nights that I go to bed and really think it would be so much better if I did not wake up in the morning. Peace, yes, peace. If nothing else, there would be peace. I often think that if there could only be peace when I'm dead, I would like that to come soon. Just peace, peace. I never go to bed without feeling that it would be nice if I did not wake up again. The first thing I say to myself in the morning is, why? I get into my car and say it would be nice if someone were to run into me and I went through the windshield. Yes, peace, if nothing else. Death would bring peace. And how many thousands of people privately feel that way? Searching for peace. Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, ready to come into your heart tonight and give you the peace 
that you're longing for. You remember when the Hurricane Bell was pounding its way up the Atlantic and it hit parts of Pennsylvania and New York and Connecticut and Vermont and they had all those floods in Vermont? The national weather map, if you remember, showed a 25-mile swath of complete calm precisely in the center of that hurricane. And that's exactly what Jesus said. He said, in the midst of the hurricane of life, in the midst of the storms of life, I can give you peace. He said, in the world ye shall have tribulation, but I've spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the center of the hurricane is a place of calm. And that's what Christ brings in the middle of your life. He doesn't remove the hurricane but he gives peace in the middle of it. And if you don't come to Christ, you sacrifice that. You give it up and you go all through life with the hurricane turning and churning and the tornado twisting in your own life. And you lack that deep inward peace that the believer has. And then the second thing you sacrifice, you sacrifice true joy. For several months, one of the three or four best sellers was Drury's The Promise of Joy. And then there was that other bestseller the, that you would see in counters and even in grocery stores, The Joy of Sex. And Maribel Morgan is writing a book called Total Joy. But overall, with suicide among the young people in the last decade climbing so rapidly, joy is in short supply. David said after he had sinned against God and his joy was gone, and he was miserable. He said, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. And how many Christians here tonight? You believe in Christ, but you've lost the joy of your salvation because of sin. You know, worry in this country is at an all-time high. And a, a, a doctor at the Mayo Clinic said a few weeks ago, quote, Worry affects the circulation, the heart, and the glands, and the whole nervous system, and profoundly affects the health. And Jesus is promising all the time to replace the worry with joy, his joy. He said that your joy may be full. Whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's the joy that he provides. Now, you're going to miss that. If you don't come to Christ, you'll miss that. And some of you have just enough religion to make you miserable. I don't know anybody any, in the world any more miserable than a person trying to be a Christian who really isn't. Like when these sailors go to the Far East, or I go to the Far East, I remember... <laughs> I've been to the Far East many times and I was on my way to Vietnam to speak to the troops on one occasion. And I stopped in Honolulu and uh, they said, you need to get, um, oh, I forgot what shot it was now, but it was 10 cc's in those days to uh, keep you from getting something or other. And uh, this uh, uh, Navy fella, I think it was about the second shot he'd given. And because I was a preacher, he either wanted it to hurt real bad or he was he pushed it in real slow. Uh, and uh, I'll never forget, I limped out of there like this because of that shot. Some of you have had that experience. And get a little bit sick. And that keeps you from getting the real thing. And the hardest people in the world to win to Christ are people that have been reared in a Christian home, that have gone to church, and have a, enough religion to know the language, but they've never known the real joy and the real peace and the real Christ. And they are inoculated against getting the real thing. Those are the miserable people. And then thirdly, you sacrifice hope. Hope. 
I heard about a fellow that was riding in a propeller airplane and the passengers saw first one motor went out. I've been on airplanes where motors went out and blew up, as a matter of fact. And finally, three of the four engines were gone. The passengers were scared to death and the cabin door opened and the pilot appeared with a parachute on his back. <laughs> and he said, calm down, everybody. Don't panic, he said, I'm going for help. <laughs> now that's about as far as the world can go. They're saying, don't panic, don't panic. Everybody's arming to the teeth. Don't panic, don't panic. Somehow we'll muddle through. We'll get through somehow. And there's the philosophy, as I said last evening, a philosophy of despair and discouragement. And researchers claim that between 70,000 and 80,000 young people between the ages of 15 and 20 attempt suicide every year. Why? Because they have no hope. In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, has promised. Hope of the future is more important than anything else. Happy is he whose hope is in the Lord his God, said the psalmist. Paul said we're saved by hope. Paul also said, if in this life only we have hope, we're of all men most miserable. My hope is in the world to come as well as in this world. The coming again of Christ, the kingdom that he's going to set up, the time when there will be peace on the world, on the earth. I'll talk about that tomorrow. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, says the scripture. Which would you rather be? A millionaire tonight and tomorrow found to be an embezzler and put into prison for the rest of your life? Or would you rather be penniless tonight and certain of being a millionaire in eternity? I'll take being the millionaire in eternity. The hope of tomorrow is more important than the possessions of today. Our hope is in Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven. I would rather be the poorest child of God tonight and have that wealth that God is preparing for us there not material wealth necessary. We think of wealth in terms, did you read that marvelous story on Mother Teresa that was in the paper the other day? She was at the Eucharist conference in uh, Philadelphia and one of the great women of our time. I remember I was in Calcutta about a year ago, maybe 18 months ago. And one of the first questions I ask is, how could I see Mother Teresa? And a man from the American consul there said, well, I think I can take you to where she is. I don't know whether we'll get to see her or not. And we went back some dark alleys and back into one of the dirtiest, slummiest places I'd ever been. In fact, I was a little bit nervous. And there we went into this place, the house of the dying, where Mother Teresa holds in her arms dying people so they can die with dignity. And some of the nuns came and uh, when they found out that I was there, they said, well, mother is holding a dying man right now, but we'll go see. Said she doesn't see many people right now. About 30 minutes later, in came Mother Teresa. And we sat down and talked. And I'd just been told that she had received the Nehru Award and that when Mrs. Gandhi presented it to her, that for the first time people saw Mrs. Gandhi cry. Yes, I'd rather be Mother Teresa living in that slum in Calcutta than to be the richest man in all the world when I get to heaven. Laying up treasures in heaven. And she said the most, the poorest people in all the world 
are in the affluent West. She said, you Americans are very poor. I'm going back to some rich people. They're rich in God, rich in Christ. And you know, we strive for material things and we try to get all we can get and so forth and we can't take it with us. You don't see any you haulets following a hearse on the way to the graveyard. <laughs> can't take any of it with us. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lost his own soul? What if you did gain the whole world and lost your soul? And you know what else you lose by not coming to Christ? You lose the knowledge of the purpose and meaning of your life on this planet. You lose that. Dr. Mallory, the great psychiatrist in Atlanta, said the other day, unhappiness is common today because people have lost their sense of purpose. And he blamed it in partial, partially on the loss of religious faith. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Camorra. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices? He said, all your religious sacrifices and all of your churches is not enough. What's the purpose of it if you don't have true faith? The scripture says Daniel purposed in his heart. Paul purposed in his spirit. Do you have a purpose and is that purpose centered in God? God has a plan for your life. Are you living according to God's plan? And then the last thing that you lose, you lose eternal life. Carlyle, the great philosopher, once said, one life, a little gleam of time between eternities. I don't know all that's involved in eternal life. There's a mystery to it. I only know that when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior here tonight, you become a possessor of eternal life. Not the day you die, but tonight, right now. God performs a miracle in your heart. Christ comes to live inside. And both of the men that testified tonight testified that they'd been in the church. One of them a clergyman's son but they didn't really know Christ. There's a vast difference. Time Magazine said, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, that 69% of Americans are sure that there's life after death. You know, that's what we're on Mars for. We're up there looking for life. We spent a billion dollars to send those vehicles, up, that vehicle up there. And it's reaching out, searching around, trying to find something that would tell us that there's life like we know it on the planet, Mars. But we can have eternal life and live forever with Christ. That's what he offers. You can't push death away. You'll never live this evening over again. The hour that you spent here, the two hours you spent here, you'll never live again. It's gone forever. And death is approaching to all of us because it is appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. But eternal life can begin right here and now. You know, we spend $25 billion a year in America to get rid of pain. The Bible says that there's a heaven and there's a hell. Heaven forever, hell forever. And you must make the choice. Whatever is meant by hell, whatever Jesus meant by it, he was the one that did the talking about it. And you can draw your own conclusions when you read the passages. But you can take the deepest and the greatest and the most thrilling experience you've ever had in your whole life and, and double it and redouble it 10 million times and you have heaven and take the worst moment of your life and double it 10 million times and you'll have just a little bit of what hell must be.